Today is the day for you to be free from guilt and condemnation. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Sadly, the Christian world has minimalized Christianity to mean making right decisions, living right, talking right, doing all the right things. And we've trivialized it because those things come as a result of us being Christians. Those are not the things that make us Christians. And so we have to get right perspective on this. <clears throat> and so it is a lot of times the things that we've done, said, thought, that open the door for guilt and condemnation. So today we're gonna to deal that a death knell so that you can walk free and not live under guilt and condemnation anymore. Jesus Christ paid the price so that you and I could live free. Now, guilt and condemnation, if you have lived with that, if you walk free from that and you have no worry and you're not concerned about your standing with God because you know that you're in right standing with God because you've received Jesus Christ and God received his sacrifice, then you can walk free and not live under guilt and condemnation. But if you have believed that guilt and condemnation or your conscience even is what guides you and leads you and that's what you listen to, then you're going to feel naked without it. Because it, sometimes it feels good to feel guilty. It feels good to worry. And if you're a worrier and you're getting rid of worry, then you're worried when you're not worried. Does that make sense? If, if you're a worrier, that does make sense. But here's a, here is a, a thought for you. Your mind is to be your servant, not your master. Uh, my middle daughter had trouble for a while. She couldn't go to sleep at night because her mind would not turn off. That mind is subject to me, not my master. So we have to take authority of that. We're not going that direction though. We're talking about guilt and condemnation and it being gone from this moment on. We're going to receive what Jesus Christ has done for us and walk free because that is what he wants for us. He does not want us to live under guilt and condemnation. If we live by shoulds, and I taught several weeks ago about the gospel of should, but if we live in shoulds, that is after the fact. But the Holy Spirit leads us and the shoulds come in after the fact that you should have done that. You should have. And it's always afterwards to bring guilt and condemnation. But the Holy Spirit comes to lead us. We're going this direction. Go here. Go there. And he speaks to us, leading us in the direction that we're to go. Doesn't come in the back door to say, oh, you should have done it. Oh, you should have known better. No, that is not the Holy Spirit. Now, he will convict us at times when we've missed it. And he say, he'll come to me and say, Debbie, let me teach you. This is the way we, sh we are going to do this. This is the way, walk ye in it. And the word tells us that we will hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. So leading us, guiding us, directing beforehand so that we know the right direction, not feeling guilt and condemnation coming in after the fact to beat us over the head. Years ago, I dated a, a wonderful young man who was a minister's son and, um, and all that, and he asked me to marry him. Um, it seemed like the perfect guy. You know, he'd been raised in a minister's home just like me. Uh, he was going to be in the ministry, which I uh, certainly was familiar with and had a kinship with. And, um, but when he asked me to marry him, I knew that, that was, he was not the direction for my life. And so I had to tell him no. Well, he did, his parents didn't live uh, or lived 
in direction over by uh, where I was living at the time. And so every, I would go by a certain road and I could look over and see their house. And so every time I would drive by their house, I would look over there and see if his car was there. And then I'd beat myself up. Did I do the right thing? Oh, did I miss it? Did I? I mean, and this went on for a period of time. And I finally got to the point and I said, wait a minute. God, you are a big God. And he is. And I said, you know what? I don't want to miss you, which I don't. And I hear your voice. You were able to stop Paul, Saul on the road to Tarsus, stop him dead in his tracks, to lead him in the calling for his life. If you can do that for Saul, and I'm missing you, you can let me know. I refuse to look over at that house anymore and wonder and beat myself up over it. I'm not being rebellious. I'm just, I'm stopping this. And I'm giving you permission to speak, and I will hear if I've missed you. Well, the first few times that I drove by there, I had to, nope, I'm not going to look. And so I go on. And then the next time, nope, I'm not going to look. Well, you know what? Then I didn't look anymore because it wasn't a point of contention. And then God never spoke to me. So I heard from God, but I was allowing guilt and condemnation. Did I miss God? I was allowing it to beat me silly. And I finally said, no, I'm not doing that. And, I, and thank God, I was able to stop. I didn't know some of the tools that I know now by the word of God and some of the other ways that the enemy wants to come at us that we can be successful to see him defeated in our lives. We hear condemnation all the time. Because Satan is the accuser of the brethren. For example, if you would pray 15 minutes, then you're going to hear, oh, you should have prayed 30. You read two chapters in the Bible, oh, if only you could have read four. You should have gone to bed earlier. You should save money. Oh, you shouldn't have spent your money there. Oh, you should exercise. Mm, you shouldn't have spoken to that person that way. Oh, you should have called your mom today. Oh, and it goes on and on and on. And the funny thing about it, not funny, but seriously, if when you accomplish one, then something else uh, will pop up. Well, then you didn't do it enough. It's like whack-a-mole. Did you ever play that in one of those arcades where the little uh, mole is coming up and you're trying to get it down and then they've got several coming up at one time? And so if we don't understand the tactics of the enemy, we fall prey. And even more sadly, if we don't recognize the tactics of the enemy, if we don't know the voice of the Father, then we fall prey hearing these things, mistaking it for God, thinking that that is God speaking to us. And most of us, or all of us, wanting to be good, wanting God to love us, we would never say no. I mean, what's bad about reading four chapters? Well, absolutely nothing. But the truth of the matter is, God would rather you read one verse that you can meditate on and you can chew on that gets dropped into your spirit. It's not here. We are not checking off a checklist. Ooh, I prayed 15 minutes, check. I read two chapters, check. God is not looking at that. He's more concerned with my right believing than the way I live because he knows if I believe right, I'm going to live right. We have it backwards. We want to live regardless of what we're doing in here, and we say we should live this way, that way, and we're doing it backwards. He wants us to believe right so we can live right. So God would rather me read a verse, meditate it on it all day, that it becomes a part of me, that it comes alive in my spirit, that revelation comes, that then it works in my life, that it, that it changes me, that it brings life to me. God is more concerned with that than me reading 50 chapters a day and not remembering what I read. I used to um, ask my kids what they learned in Sunday school when we'd come home from church. They couldn't remember, you know, their minds would go blank. But about Thursday, four days later, about Thursday, they would start talking about what the teacher had said in Sunday school. 
So see, some things had dropped in there. It just came, you know, it was just not right in the front of their mind. Uh, I remember years ago, we had a lady stand up and she was going to give a testimony and she wanted to share her favorite scripture. She just loved this scripture. And then she had this blank look on her face because she couldn't remember what the scripture was. So we all have those times. But God wants us to read the word that it brings life. God wants us to read the word so that we see Jesus Christ. Because that's what the word is about. Jesus is the word become flesh. That word all through the Old Testament, what we see is shadow of Jesus Christ who is to come. And then in the New Testament, he comes. He makes a new covenant because of the sacrifice and the blood that he shed. It tells us that it's a better covenant, a new covenant and a better covenant. So we want to move out of the Old Testament where we're living under uh, religious laws that keep us entrapped in, in without receiving the redemption, without receiving the blood, that sacrifice that Jesus made for all men, for all humans, from past, present, and future, all the way back when he was crucified. That sacrifice went all the way back to Adam and Eve, and it goes forward to the last man and woman that will be born and live on this earth. His sacrifice was more than enough. So we want to walk in that and receive what he's done, not try to earn something by our own uh, uh, short efforts that will not accomplish anything. So if I listen to these uh, uh, condemnation statements all the time, the accusations of the enemy to me, then I always feel like I'm falling short and I can never come to God like he says. In Hebrews, it tells us 4.16, it says to come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find help in time of need. But I can't come to God because, um, uh, you know what, oh, well, I, I've got to, uh, oh, I need to repent for the last uh, five minutes. Okay, hold on, hold on, uh, repent. Now, oh, I'm hoping he's, oh, I hope he'll receive that. Uh, and, and so I don't come boldly to the throne. I come intimidated. But, you know, the Word says, Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But you've got to rightly divide the Word of Truth. That's talking about me before I came to Christ. Before I came to Christ, yes, I fell short. But because of Jesus Christ, I am now accepted in the beloved, and I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. My life is hidden in Christ because of Jesus. So therefore, because of what Jesus has done for me, already done, I can come boldly to the throne. Because when I come, the word says that he's ever interceding for me. If God would have a question about me, he looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, I see Debbie's here. Was your sacrifice pure enough, whole enough to cover her? And Jesus goes, oh, yes. My blood was enough that covered, and not covered, I'm sorry, it washes away my sin. Let me, let me kill a religious cow. I talked to someone just last week who had been taught all their life that when they got to heaven, that they were going to stand before God and give an account for their life. Well, let me ask you about that. When you came to Jesus Christ, were your sins washed away or were they not? If our sins were washed away, then there is no sin that God will bring up to us. Because if he brings it up, it's not washed away. That right there will set many of you free because you're dreading, you're looking forward to heaven, but on the other hand, you're dreading it because, oh, what is God going to say? He's going to say, come on in, just like he said to Paul, thou good and faithful servant. Can you believe that God would say that to you? 
You need to believe that you're accepted in the beloved. You know, true humility is not bowing and scraping the ground and getting as low as you can before God. True humility is believing what God says about you, not how you feel. I may feel that I come short. I may feel that I'm not worthy, but it's not based on what I feel or what I think. It is based on what the Word of God says. So true humility is, even though I feel like a rat, even though I feel like I'm nothing, He says that I can come boldly and I'm going to believe and act on his word because he's the one that matters. He's the one that will uh, make judgment. Although in John, it says that he's turned all judgment over to Jesus Christ. (laughs) Oh, how wonderful our Lord and Savior is. It tells us in 1 John 3.21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, We have confidence toward God. So you see how damaging condemnation can be? Because once we're condemned, I I have no confidence toward God because I think I'm going to be struck dead. We have proof of that. Let's look. Let's go back. Where did condemnation start? We can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. So it's certainly nothing new. It's something that came with the fall that we see that uh, that Satan did and spoke to Adam and Eve. So in Genesis chapter 3, verses 7, 8, and 10 and 11, it says, I'm reading out of God's words translation. Then their eyes were opened, and they both realized that they were naked. They've eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil now. They sewed fig leaves together and made clothes for themselves. Let me interject right there. Notice how when the fall came, before, when God created them, he did everything before they were created. Created everything they were going to need. Even told them that there was gold in the hills, and it was good gold. There were rivers, planted them gardens, gave them, um, let them name the animals. All these things. And all of a sudden, once they fell, they started works. They sewed fig leaves together and made clothing for themselves. Even though God had clothed him with their, his glory before that, they didn't realize they were naked. All right, back to the scripture. In the cool of the evening, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden. So they hid from God among the trees in the garden. See? Their heart condemned them. They did not have confidence toward God. So instead of going toward God, they stayed away from God. They hid themselves. And God says, where are you? Do you think God didn't know where they were? Of course he did. He, that was not a location question. That was a revelation and exposure question of them. And it says their response was, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid uh, I was afraid because I was, I was naked, so I hid. So what, what was God's response? God asked, who told you that you were naked? Isn't it interesting that his first response was not about being angry, that they had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Of course he knew it. But you know what? He gave them free choice. That's the trouble with free choice. You have the choice to make wrong decisions. Oh, but beloved, you need to know this. Here's the great thing. Jesus Christ is by which I make all decisions, but it is then by Jesus Christ all of my bad decisions are rectified. Oh, I don't set out to, oh, this is a bad idea, let's do that. I don't set out that way, but there are times that I make decisions that it has a bad outcome. But Jesus Christ came to rectify it, that I'm cleansed, that I'm washed clean, that he can restore. Praise God for what he's done. So God wasn't angry because they took of the fruit. He dealt with that later. But his first question was, who told you that you were naked? They were condemned. 
See, there is the dual side of the enemy. Oh, you need to eat this fruit because you're going to be like God. They already were like God. He always wants to make you think that you don't have something that God has already provided. It may not be manifested yet, but that you have your position uh, in God, your uh Uh, prosperity that God has for you. He always wants to make it seem like it's not there. And then when he has deceived you into partaking or whatever, he comes around on the backside and says, oh, and you call yourself a Christian. And he wants to condemn us. Doesn't matter how young you are. And I want to tell you, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you don't get hold of it, it's a trick he will use forever. You, You know what? You need to understand God taught Satan everything he knows. Satan learned everything he knows from God. But here's the good part. God did not teach Satan everything that God knows. So he's limited. But when he finds a strategy that works in our lives, sometimes we're blind to it and he will try to work under the radar because he knows if we take authority over him, he has to leave. He has to flee. I have a friend that... um, a couple years ago, I was talking with her, and um, uh, we get together and talk about the Lord, and it's, it's just wonderful. But she was doing Bible studies and stuff, and she was talking about things that the enemy would come, and I just said, then tell him to hush. Just say hush. And so a couple weeks later, I saw her again, and she came in, and she was like, it works. She goes, I couldn't believe it. It works. And I said, yes, we don't have to listen to that nasty voice. And so hush. What did Jesus do when he was coming against Satan in the wilderness? He said, it is written. It is written. And then the word says, after three times, it is written, three different circumstances. It says that Satan left him for a more opportune time. So he was going to come back, but he left him for a more opportune time. So I want you to know God has given us authority, but we have to take authority. See, there are many things that we read in the scriptures, and because God says, oh, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, we just think, oh, that's it, it's just going to happen. Well, we, the enemy wants to take that from us. And so we have to stand. You know what? No matter what I see, no matter what I feel, God, I'm going to believe what you have said for me. I'm going to believe that your word is true, not all the negative things that the enemy is trying to scare me with, what he's projecting to my future or, or dragging up from my past that I can't enjoy my present. You know what? God, you were with me where I was, and you're going with me where I'm going. So I'm not going to fear. Because it tells us in, I believe, 1 John, perfect love casts out fear. So when I realize how much God loves me, I can quelch, squelch those um, uh, accusations of the enemy. In fact, in Ephesians 6, when it talks about putting on uh, the, our armor, putting on the armor of God, it talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I mean, there are other things, but I'm not teaching on those today. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and our shield of faith, and what does it say about that? Ephesians 6, it quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked or of Satan. So when he's slinging stuff at me, I put up my shield of faith and I say, doesn't matter what's coming, God says, God says, God says, God said, and it, it puts out those fiery darts and I can stand on what God has said. So we see that condemnation goes all the way back to, their, to the um, garden. But we need to settle this. You need to settle this in your heart. God loves you. It does not matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you're doing. God loves you. How do I know? Because it tells me in Romans that even when I was a sinner, before I ever repented, before I ever was born, before I ever knew about God, it says that God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, God's not waiting for us to repent. He already made the provision before we were even a thought to our parents. Of course, God knew of us. And it says while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
God loves us. If he loved me when I was at my worst, then what can I do now that would make him love me less? Oh, there's the good news of, of the gospel and of our salvation. God loves me. Perfect love casts out fear. So look, today we can get rid of guilt, condemnation, and fear because we're hearing the truth of the gospel of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It also tells us, of course, in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world, that was me, that he gave his only begotten son, not his only son, you and I are sons and daughters when we come into the family adopted, but his only begotten son, that whosoever should uh, uh, believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, perishing is not just uh, when we die and go to hell. You know what, if I'm in need and I don't have the resources, I'm perishing. If I'm sick and I need to be healed and I'm suffering, I'm perishing. Um, anything that's being stolen from me, I'm perishing. And John 10.10 10 tells us that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly. For you see, when I came to Jesus Christ, I received eternal life then. I'm not waiting until I die. If I wait till I die to have it, it's too late then. So I have eternal life now. He has turned my life. He has made me alive unto him. And so it, I have it now. In the Old Testament, it talks about days of heaven on the earth. God is wanting us to live now as ambassadors of heaven on the earth to provide all that we need to, give, to heal our bodies. Jesus made all these provisions. And so God wants us to have that now. What can restrain me from coming boldly to the throne of grace in my time of need? Guilt and condemnation. As I read before, if our heart condemns us, we do not have confidence toward God. If, if, God, if I believe God teaches through condemnation by should, then I won't come against it. Why? Because if I believe that's God speaking to me, I'm not going to tell God to be quiet. But you see, now that we're alive unto God, I hear God speak to my heart and my spirit. It is not me controlling myself to do right. Colossians 1 tells us that he's delivered us from the kingdom of control and dominion and delivered us into the kingdom of the son of his love. So it is not controlling myself that I never do anything wrong. If you haven't heard me say this, and the first time I heard my friend Dr. Kennedy say this, I was just in shock. But then the more I thought about it, I thought, she's right. What you do will not send you to hell. <gasps> gasp. I hear it. I hear that collective gasp out there. What we do will not send us to hell. The only thing that sends me to hell is not receiving Jesus Christ as my Savior. Not my actions of sin, doing uh, uh, as in a verb, sinning. Jesus came and washed away my sin, the seed to sinning. And so therefore, since I've received Jesus Christ, I'm going to heaven. I have eternal life. I stand on that word. I know that. Even Jesus stood on that word. It says in Psalms that you will not leave my soul in Sheol. And so Jesus, when he died, was dying in faith that God was going to fulfill that word that he wasn't going to leave him in Sheol. Another subject. We're not going there. Um, I talked about earlier about feeling good about being guilty, feeling guilty or feeling good about worrying. Um, when we lived in Statesville, North Carolina, which is about an hour from Charlotte, uh, we were in a denomination and we lived in the parsonage. And the two houses next to us, the one next to us, uh, was condemned and the one across the street was condemned and the house we were living in needed a lot of work and my mom and dad worked hard to bring it up um, uh, for us to live in 
And, but the lady next door to us had, I think, five children, and she was a single parent, but, I mean, her house was spotless, and she took care of her kids. However, the, the family that lived across the street from there, those kids were in rags, and just, uh, it was nasty. And so she, uh, the lady was pregnant again, and so uh, she had asked uh, my mom and the lady next door to us to help take care of the kids when the time came for her to go to the hospital because her husband had to work. And so uh, that time came, and she went to the hospital to have the baby. And, of course, in those days, people stayed longer. And so when my mom and uh, this other lady went in there, the, the mother had cooked up enough food and left it on pots on the stove for her family to eat while she was gone. Well, you can imagine that's going to be three or four days, what that would be by, by what it would be like by the fourth day. But that's all these people knew. But mom brought uh, one of the little girls home. She took her clothes, which were rags, and washed them and got them all clean. And so while she was washing her clothes, she put her in some clothes that I had. And so, but the little girl could not wait to get back in her rags. That's all she knew, but that's what she was comfortable in. What are you comfortable in? Are you comfortable in staying condemned? Are you comfortable staying guilty? Or do you want to walk free? Do you want to walk stressless? Do you want to walk in all that God has for you that you walk in eternal life? You see, God doesn't want us. He wants us to be in abundance. He wants us to minister out of our abundance. He wants to give out of our abundance. He wants us to live out of our abundance. But somehow in Christianity, we have made it into, um, uh, you can never say no. You have to do everything. So therefore, you're not being led by the Spirit. Jesus didn't get everybody. When he went to the man at the pool of Bethesda, it says that there were a great many folk laying there, but he only went to that man. Why? He was being led by the Spirit. The Spirit knows when people are ready to receive. There are a lot of people that are just takers, and they'll keep taking as long as you give. We've got to be directed by God that he leads us to those that are ready to hear and receive. If not, religion will cause us to give away everything we've got it will cause us to not have a spare moment. It causes us to police ourselves. We don't have a moment to think about anything else. Therefore, after, if possible, that we get ourselves under control, we now have to police others or at least bring them into the same police station so they understand how they've got to live. And so it, it makes us want to be um, ragged and torn, stolen from um, um, people that are in the ministry um, I know a lot of times people look at them and go, ooh, isn't that great? But a lot of times, uh, particularly pastors and their wives, wives can feel like the church or the church people are the other woman because the pastor is pouring out so much to them, and then he's got nothing left for his wife. He's tired. He comes home irritable because he's given everything away. And how do you come against people that are in need? That's very difficult. But then... Here's a family that God has given you. My dad, um, when we were young, uh, my, my grandfather had been uh, high up in, in a denomination. And so my father was kind of uh, following him in his footsteps. And an older pastor pulled my dad aside and he said, you know what, you're not called to be your dad. And secondly, if you win the world but you lose your family, you've got nothing. And so, yes, God does want the world to be one. Jesus died for all of us. But when God blesses us with a family, that's our first mission field. Not that we're giving so much to other people in need and then our own kids are suffering from uh, lack and no attention from parents because we're paying attention to so many other kids whose parent maybe are single parents uh, or single you know, single parent families and they don't have a, a, a father in the home. So let me spend time over here, but then you don't have time to father or mother your own children. That's wrong. Our first thing is to reach out to our own family, love them, have fun with them, spend time with them, and enjoy what they've given. Or there again is the condemnation that the enemy brings in on us. He will condemn us for not spending time enough for people in need. He will condemn us for not spending time with our family. 
And so this is where, Father, you must lead me. You must help me draw lines so that that guilt and condemnation doesn't come in. All right, sorry, that was just an extra one. Christ is enough. He is my burden bearer. He paid a great price for me, and it was enough. Um, we are led by the Spirit, not by our conscience. Our conscience is not the Spirit of God. As I said earlier, our conscience, our mind, is our servant, not our master. We have to get it that in right order. Because if I give my religious, legalistic conscience free reign, I'm in big trouble. I am in big trouble. So, but Jesus said, this is in red in John 16, 13. When he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you of things to come. God wants us to be free from condemnation. Every time we come before God, we can come in right standing with him because of what Jesus Christ has done. Next time the, the condemnation comes, the voices begin to come and reap you over the coals and beat you up and make you feel like nothing. Let me tell you what, we can neutralize it with the shield of faith, <clears throat> the sword of the spirit, the word of God. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, the weapons of our war warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. Cast it. What are the strongholds? Arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So what does that mean? Well, that means when the enemy comes to us and he says, you're such a loser. That is a thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, who says that I am the righteousness of God in Christ, which is in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, you're never going to prosper. Look at your checkbook. Look at what's due. Look at you have no income. And then I cast down that high thought that wants to raise itself against the knowledge of God, which is 2 Corinthians 8, 9, that by his grace, Jesus became poor on the cross, that even though he was rich, yet for my sake he became poor, that through his poverty I might be rich. Yes, that's in the word, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. What if the enemy comes and says, you know, you have every reason to worry. Romans 5, 1 says, I have peace with God. See, the enemy is, is a thief, as it tells us in John 10, 10. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life more abundantly. He's like a thief. If we let him in the door, we can't get him out. So we slam that door in his face. And when he makes all these statements and condemns us and brings in guilt and all that, we tear it down by the word of the living God. If it worked for Jesus, he's my example. And Jesus said, it is written. I come back and I say, it is written. If he says, nobody likes you. And I come back because of Christ. I am accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 6. Oh, here's one. Now, let me tell you, I've been saved for many, 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 many years. But every once in a while, the enemy tries this one on me. You know, maybe you're not really saved. That'll give you pause. And so, I, you know, I find myself going, well, maybe. And then I would stop it. The word says, if I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that I am saved, I do that continually. Jesus Christ is Lord. I confess him as my Lord and Savior. I am saved. It is written. Praise God. Will I ever make it through this? Whatever you're facing, whatever you're facing, will I ever make it through this? But 1 John 4.18 says, the perfect love of God. Well, it says perfect love casts out God. Make the scriptures per personal. The perfect love of God casts out all my fear. 
we tear down those lies, those arguments, those uh, thoughts that would exalt themselves above the knowledge of God, bringing our thoughts into captivity. You're not going there. We're not thinking that. Uh, when my children were little, firstborn, I decided I was not going to be afraid about my kids because when they're young, when they're little, um, it's that sudden infant death syndrome. Well, they get past that. Well, then they're crawling. Well, they might put something in their mouth. Then they're a toddler. They may run out in the door. And now all my children are driving. I have two in college, a uh, 15 year old. She started driving. I refuse to worry. I am not going to let my mind be filled with things that haven't happened because thinking about them does not stop them from happening. I cover them in the blood of the Lamb. I put angels on assignment over them, and I trust God. So sometimes we just have to make up our mind, I, I don't care how I feel, I'm just not doing it. And then, follow, and then every time it starts gnawing at the edges, no, nope, I'm not going there. Nope, I'm not going there because he wants you to open up the door to let the thought come in. And then he wants you to take it in your hands so that you kind of feel it. Mm, how does that feel? Mm, oh, yeah, I could accept that. And then if I think it and I feel it, that can be my downfall. So I stop it before I allow the feelings to come in. And before I bring it all in and say, let's have a party, I say, no way. Depression. Um, Sure, I've had plenty of things in my life that want to make me get depressed and things like that, but I've come to this realization. You know what? When I allow myself to get depressed, it is too hard to pull myself back up out of there. It's not worth the effort. It's not worth the slide, no matter how good that feels for a few days or however long I want to let it go on, to wallow in that mess, that I'm just going, you know what? It's just not worth the time. I'm not going there because Jesus is my life. He's my health. He's my joy. So as I said, we come against it like Jesus. It is written. I am not talking positive thinking. Don't just have positive thoughts. Oh, nobody likes you. Oh, yes, people do. No, don't go there. That's positive thoughts. And it's great to think positively. And I believe when we are filled with faith, we will think and talk positively. But talking or thinking positively doesn't necessarily create faith. So um, there again, I'm coming from the inside out, not outward in, inwardly. So therefore, I have to come against the guilt and condemnation because it's a demonic force with a spiritual weapon. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is why we put it in our hearts so that we might know God and that we can live successfully, prosperously, happy, joyful, and stressless, resting in God. So the word says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1, and that's us. God bless you. Today is your day to be free.